Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore Club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today I'm sitting down with Silvercore Ambassadors and my friends, Jason Budd and Dean Nugent. Silvercore, when selecting ambassadors, looks for people who have a positive outlook, a passion for life, a zeal for the outdoors. They're always looking to make themselves better, to perfect their craft and to share that with others and to share that positivity with others. And Jason and Dean are absolutely no exception to that rule. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me on the Silver Core podcast. Thanks for having me yeah, back. Thanks for having us. An ambassador, I'm actually touched by that. <laughs> well, you guys just came back from, uh, I've been watching the feed here for a bit, a little bit jealous. Uh, you were in the Smoke Bluffs out in Squamish. You were in uh, climbing in Skaha there in Kelowna, Penticton, Kelowna. Penticton. Penticton area. Yeah. Uh, it's been a while since we've been there, eh, Jace? Well, we had you, Tiff, and um, my partner at the time quite a few years ago. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Maybe 13, 2013? That's going back or a bit. Or even further. Going back a bit. I got to dust yeah. off some of my old climbing kit. I still Probably use yeah. it, but I haven't been using it for climbing. For yeah. maybe in eight years since I last down Yeah, there. so maybe we were there 2010, 11, maybe, with Tiff, because I know it was like a... Semi, we camped at the Bramberry campsite and. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was, that was a good deal. We ate well. And Dean, I'm looking at some of the food that you've been making up. Oh, the steak dinner. You missed the steak dinner. Yeah. That looked amazing. But you were saying earlier that you only climb with Jace. Yeah. I don't trust anybody else. So have you climbed much? Um, I only got into climbing 2014 when I come over the first time Mm -hmm. and it was like, Jace was like, oh, come on, let's try, you know. Yeah. I, he was getting into climbing. So he says, I'll take you out. And it was like, is this my thing? Mm. Because sometimes you're following somebody in life or you want to do it. Sure. So I was like, yeah, okay, we'll go and have a go at this. Um, and then it was like, bloody hell. Why did I, how, Why haven't I done this sooner? Well, it's when we went and did Star Trek. Yeah, yeah. And oh. I've taken Travis over Star Trek. Because. I, and when we got into the base, you said to me, I know why you do this. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then, because uh, the, you've got the train track, haven't you? Runs, yeah. there's a bridge. Mm-hmm. And we was halfway up and this train's coming. So I'm looking down this valley with mountains in the background, a train going over the bridge. And I'm like, I'm at a place where not many people come and get this view. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing about climbing. And then as we progressed on, you know, on that trip um, to more stuff, it was like, I'm going places nobody's been before or only a select few of people would attempt to go up because the rest mm-hmm. of the people down the ground look and go, they're crazy. Mm-hmm. But the thing with Jason is he has that ability to teach you and put you in a calm place so that when you're doing it, you're like, I know whatever happens, that guy on the other end of that rope has my back. Mm-hmm. That's where the trust thing comes in. Yeah. And that was something that we were talking about earlier. And I thought, you know, that's, that'll be an interesting topic on the, uh, on the podcast just to maybe touch on a little bit. Um, but being able to find that trust in others and then in yourself as well, the confidence that being outdoors brings you, that being in the mountains brings you, that being on the rock face when you turn around and say, you know, there are others out there that do this, but we've just narrowed those numbers down significantly. Yeah. I, there's a level of confidence that comes with that. How did, 
Well, you know, why don't we rewind a little bit? How did you and Jason first meet? So um, I joined the army in 99 and we used to have two phases. So you have phase one where you go and learn how to iron your kit, make your bed, eat, do lots of fitness and you get to a certain stage. Then you would do phase two, which was infantry training. Mm -hmm. um, and my platoon, when we passed out, uh, we only had, I think it was something like 12 or 15 guys passed out, out of the 30 odd. So it was known as a small platoon. So then Jason's was the same. So we got, when we got to Catrick, the English guys from the Prince of Wales division were told, right, you're, you're going to be put in a jock platoon. Mm -hmm. Straight away, it's like, oh, what, jocks? <laughs> that's Scots. Right, so that, right. Yeah, that's yeah. Scots. So it's, it's not an athlete. Um, so straight away, we're like, oh, jocks. And all the training staff were Scottish, you know, um, training staff as well. So straight away, the English were on the back foot. Because mm -hmm. the jocks in English don't really like each other to a point. Sure. We're not fighting anymore, but there's still that. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, we're just... So I was one of the oldest and Jason was one of the oldest. So, so I was, say all this at 21, 22. Yeah. Right. Because right. average age is like 16, 17. You, you guys are old boys. Well, they, yeah. called him as grand, they called me granddad. At 21. At 21. Yeah. yeah. And it's like... So um, this is 99. Yeah. 99, yeah, 99 yeah. 2000, beginning of 2000. So straight away, we sort of mingled to each other because of our age mm -hmm. and then got talking to Jason. He had his experience in the Canadian army. So it was like, okay. And my father was in the army. I was in the army cadet. So I have a background in the military. So it was like, yeah, we know what's coming. We'll just get on with it type of thing. Mm. Um, but then when you had your time off, Jason would like, he was like, oh, I'm going to stay here. I said, oh, come down to mine, you know, come and meet my mum and everything. So we'd get the train down to mine, go and meet mum. And then eventually my mother was like, that he'd sort of been adopted. So at the end of training, when you pass out, they have a parade. So we do this big parade. We march up and down the square. Everybody that's got family go for this curry lunch. Mm. Anybody that doesn't have anybody there goes back to the block and have to clean it. So, of course, Jason's now going because he hasn't got any family over from Canada. Right. Um, and as he's walking away, my mum shouts, where are you going? And he says, look, I've got to go back to the block because, you know, I don't have any family here. She says, you're my son, you're coming for curry lunch. So ever since then, he's been, so my mum's adopted him and he's been part of the, well, he is family to me now. It's mm -hmm. not a part, he is. He, he's a brother more than a friend. Mm -hmm. um, and it just went on for them. And then a lot of, Jason progressed in the army a lot more than I did. I sat on my thumb. Um, <laughs> so he was going down for courses down Brecon, but Tewkesbury is only an hour from Brecon. So of course then he would come back do his washing. Mum would always say, where's your dobie? Which is washing. So mm -hmm. first thing, laundry. laundry. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as soon as he gets out of the car, you know, mum's doing that. Um, and yeah, for 22, yes, 22 years. So the, the bit of the background as well as, um, if you remember, I think one of our first podcasts, my mum passed away when I was in the infantry training. Mm -hmm. So I went back for the funeral, square rooted that, and then I came back. Mm -hmm. So um, I was there for the final exercise at the, and the pass out. And I remember Dean's mom, when um, everyone had to come up and get their certificate for passing mm -hmm. and Dean's mom stood up and cheered louder. She cheered louder think. for him than me. <laughs> yeah. And even my sister stood up, stood yeah. up and oh, she was man. clapping. So, and I was like, come on now. Yeah. Really? So, I mean, and that, and to me, she was my English mother. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, I talked about when being injured on that, on the, on the last day of the hills and selection, there was mm -hmm. mother waiting out on the drive as I pulled up, coming out, big hug, grabbed the laundry right away. Um, really? Like it, it, when I say like family, like when I got f fastball to go to Afghan with that, you know, one, two weeks notice to move, I left mother mm. a blank check mm. for my bank account. And I said, this is if you need it. And unfortunately, um, Laura, which is Dean's sister, my sister, husband passed away. Mm. And mother had to use I don't know, five, 600 pounds to help sure. with the funeral arrangements. And then she sent a message out to me. It eventually gets to me and, um, and I get a message back saying, nope, that is what it was for. Right. She was going to pay me back. So I'll pay you back Sunday thing. I'm like, nope, it's a gift. Mm. That's for the years of the Sunday roast dinners, the laundry, um, the support. I didn't get all that. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like even yeah. to the point, like when I left, I accidentally forgot like 500 euros. I, I had sold a, a couch to some of the jocks in Germany I was leaving. Yeah. And I, and I just for safe keepings left it in the dress door of her, of her place. Yeah. And then I remember it as I flew, I'm like, oh, I forgot the 500 euros. And I messaged her and she's like, I'll send it to you. And I knew, I think she was going to Egypt. I'm like, nope, that is your spending money. Enjoy, mm -hmm. enjoy that, uh, the time away. So, you know, money, money comes and goes. You can make more money. You can have no money, but that connection that you have with somebody else, that bonds that you form, that trust mm -hmm. that you build, you can't put a price tag on that. And there's been many cliches written about it, but I think if people can just hold that mindset of what's truly important in life and it isn't money, no. um, it, it will help. I think it would help a lot of people in their perspective and how they comport themselves. I think they just need to be true to themselves and their friends. Mm. That's the thing with me and Jason. There's no, there's no, you know, airs and graces but we're true to each other. Mm -hmm. I'll not lie to him and he'll not lie to me. And that's the biggest thing you can ask for. And as long as you got that, you then get that respect off that other person. Mm. Even though I'm a clown sometimes, and I know I am. Sure. At the same time, I know that he's got my back. That's, that's my brother. Mm -hmm. Because I, I'm, I am me with him. I'm not, I'm nobody else. I don't pretend I am me. Developing that level of honesty or brutal honesty, not only with yourself, but with somebody else is something that a lot of people go through life and they, they, they never actually get there. No, they, yeah, they and, can't trust. And I find climbing, being in the mountains, being in the hills personally helps you to develop that level of honesty with yourself. And it kind of cuts through a lot of that noise and static that, you know, that life generally holds. So you can see what's truly important. And if you can, once you reach out yourselves, you don't really want to be hanging around other people who don't kind of have that similar perspective. That's what I find anyways. I don't know if you guys see that. No, I, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I had a few times where I've not been in wrong crowds, but there's people around that sap the energy out of you. Mm. Um, and it is once you find that circle or them people what you get back from them people is far greater than any reward. Mm -hmm. Because if you find somebody that's passionate about what they do, and it's similar to what you do, when you're out doing something, it comes natural. Mm -hmm. And and that's, that's the thing with mountains, hills, ultra running that I've done, climbing with Jason. It's that sense of belonging with that community. And that community is the same as you and wants to do what you, you, you know, you're in. Um, and yeah, it's that I'll climb with him wherever he wants to go. Well, I, I want to catch up with Jason on, uh, on where you're at with your, uh, ACMG, your ski guides, your AMJ ratings. But before I do that, I'm looking at your shirt. It says HR4K. Yeah. What is, what is that? So HR4K is, it's a brand, um, it's run by an ex guy from, uh, Hereford, the SAS. Um, and what Ben set up is a community of adventurers, operators and stuff like that. And for anybody else. Mm. So he also has the blue light services will come. Um, they have black rifle coffee, contact coffee and all the, all the other, you know, sort of veteran owned stuff. And he promotes veteran owned, you know, businesses. He promotes local businesses in Hereford. It's not all about the military, but it's about people that are motivated mm. about people, uh, that want to be part of the community that help each other. Uh, he's done a lot for veterans and they, they continue to do a lot for veterans, but they do some good stuff as well. And, you know, with the American veteran community and then the UK community, Ben and, and the rest of his team, they do some like, they, they have some wicked events. Mm. So there's like, uh, I think it's every Sunday, first Sunday of the month, they have the car, the motorbike, they, do smoke it. So he's just built a smoker. So he does brisket and everything. It's not the nice. same, but it's, you know, and it's that, and it's, it's that community where you want to be part of, mm. you know, this guy isn't of, I'm an elite and this is what I used to do. He'll sit down and talk to anybody and your story is just as good as his story. And that, and, and Chris, our friend has sat down, you know, with Ben a few times and they've talked 
and and there's a few other guys that Chris is well in with and they're in awe of Chris's story mm. because when you're in the regular forces you look up and you think they're gods you know sure. these guys but when you when you get and you don't take that away from them but when they sit and they say to you look don't you know what you've done is just as you sort of sit back and you go yeah so HR4K are it's that community base. And that's where I like that, that sort of what you were just talking about, surrounding yourself with them sort of people. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of people I want to surround myself with because they'll give you the time of day. And if they've got a contact within the security sector or, you know, shooting or what, they'll pass that on to you. Mm -hmm. There isn't a, well, who are you? You know, oh, you were just a lance corporal in the British Army. It's like, no, how can I help you out? You know, they, they always say you can tell a lot about a person by how they treat somebody who can't do anything for them. Yeah. Right. The person who will berate the wait staff or the cleaning staff because they figure that they're in a different position of power, um, tells you a lot about the person. Yeah. And I've never gone a bunch for people who will hang on their past accolades of what they used to do. I've always got time to listen. I've always got time to, um, uh, to learn about those past accolades, but it's who you are right now yep. that really makes a difference. Cause you can have been just a wonder in the past and just a prime loser now. Yeah. Um, and vice versa. So surrounding yourself with those like-minded people. I'm going to check out HR4K. Yeah, I would. Yeah. So Jace, tell me where are things going with your, uh, your journey into the hills here and getting yourself a credit. Well, the hills, you bring that up. Um, I do have to do a quick shout out, shout out to, um, I mentioned Dean's family, but I also have a Brecken family mm. and I haven't really chatted too much about them, but, um, they're a family that owns JJ surplus store in Brecken and Nessa, Vanessa, uh, mother G and they were my Brecken family and Vanessa's kind of like a little sister. Um, they always helped me when, I, every time I was there, they, um, you know, my nickname was Buddy there and uh, yeah. they've been in touch and I've gone back and visited them too. So, um, and thinking about the Hills, they, when I got injured, they already knew I was injured and off on the last day, um, cause they're friends with the DS staff. So, mm. so when I showed up in, in, at the house to see them, mother Jean was already waiting for me as well. Cup of tea knew, said, all right, son, you know, so the family entity, you don't have to be blood to be family. Right. Right. So I just had to do a shout out there because Ness is always <laughs> on my case for not mentioning her oh, in, in, our, in our podcast. But yeah, um, you know, I, I passed my full ski guide with the ACMG mm -hmm. this winter. Um, good to get that out of the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did pass cause I am in the American Mountain Guide Association for the, um, Alpine and Rock. Yeah. And they have apprentice assistant full. In Canada, we have apprentice and full, mm. full ski guide or full rock guide. Um, and the end state is to become um, a full guide in each the rock, alpine and ski. And then you're a full IFMGA, International Federation of Mountain Guide Association, mountain guide. Mm -hmm. So um, I, yeah, so I passed the full ski guide this year. Did the assistant rock last year was successful. I'm doing the assistant alpine exam in Cascades, Washington in June. And then that will qualify me as an aspirant mountain guide. So that yeah. comes with its own benefits and labels too. So next year I just have to do the full rock in Red Rock and then the full Alpine. And then I will be at that IFMGA um, member or qualified, yeah. right? So, and it's interesting, we've been talking about um, identifying or that like-minded people and um, the military is an ID, is an, is an ID you identify with sure. that. Uh, coming out, I joined the fire service. So, uh, union sticker in the window and everything. It's There's how we identity. identify ourselves, right? People like to belong to things. Belong to something, tribal. Sure. sure. Right. Um, but one thing that, I mean, I really enjoyed the fire service. I enjoyed the first year cause really robust, resilient. They train you hard as probationers, but as the first year goes on, I was missing something mm. and it was the robustness, resilience that the infantry brought me. And I realized is that we're always searching for this ID, 
And for me, it was searching for that healthy ID. Mm -hmm. What is that healthy ID for me? And I started getting involved with Outward Bound Veteran Canada. And I was already doing dabbling in climbing and stuff, but it was that first exposure with Outward Bound Veterans. We did a ski traverse. There's WAPTA, WAPTA, right? WAPTA. Yes. I think they only did two other programs and they dialed it back because that was a pretty big commitment. Right. What they were doing. But that really got me thinking, yeah, I can do this. And I really like this identity. And I actually liked what they were doing with the veterans at the time. So mm. that was really my first structure of, oh, this is what I have to do um, to go through the guiding system. Mm. And I actually did a few other courses with Outward Bound Veterans. I did the rock and then I came back as a ski instructor. So basically they'd have two guides and Outward Bounds instructor, mm -hmm. veterans instructor. And that's why I came in and did for a few years. Uh, but like everything, you can't work full-time in the fire service, train to be a guide and then keep doing other stuff because I was involved in Squamish Search and Rescue, business owner of a rescue company. Yep. And then things start falling apart, right? Yes. So, because you're doing too much. Yes. Right? So I think that's really important when coming back to that healthy ID. And that's where, for me, I identify in the mountains. And that is my actual ID right now, right? So it's funny that you kind of segued into that because as you're talking there, I was in the back of my head thinking, have you ever thought about why you identify in the mountains? And as you're going through these different accreditations to be a full-fledged mountain guide, um, as long as I've known you, you're always pushing, always striving, always looking for the next thing. Dean, like you're saying, oh, I was sitting on my thumb, but Jace was uh, progressing through the, to, through the ranks there. What is it that's pushing you? I've always like, even in the Canadian army, I was the same. I was like the next right. course, the next tour, the next posting, um, you know, maybe I'm just wired that way. Mm. Like I, my, my one partner, uh, Laura said at the time, like, when is, when is enough and is enough for you? Right. And, um, I had a chat with Dean about it. And I think for me, it's going to be that, um, for me, it'll be the IFMGA. Mm when I'm qualified as this, as a mountain guide for that. But we were talking about what we deemed as successful. Cause I mentioned, yes. cause I said we were driving. I'm like, Dean, can you text Travis and, and, and see, um, which, which place we're, which right. venue we're going to, right? right? Cause there's two. Yes. So he texted you and I said, yeah, you know, Travis is, is pretty successful. And he says, what's, what's your, uh, what make do you of, call, what yeah, do you call success? What do you call successful? And for me, it's not financial. Stabil well, it is stability in that, but it's being in a position where you can do what you want okay. and not worry about the financial obligations. Okay. Right. So for me, it could be like, I can retire from the fire service in four years. Sure. And with all the pensions, I don't have to worry. And then when I work in whatever organization as, as, as a mountain guide, I, that's for me. Mm -hmm. It's what I want to do versus mm -hmm. have to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me, that's, it could be living in a micro home off a $1,000 budget and you make it, you're growing your own food. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's successful. That's my dream. Yeah. Okay. Dean, <laughs> yeah, what, 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 what's success to you? This being able to do, like, I'm at a point where I can work and then I can stop and I can go and do what I want to do. Mm. I don't own a home or anything back in the UK. Just I'll stay where I'm working mm -hmm. and I'll go see my children. And then it's like, right, um, I'm in a happy place. I'm surrounded by the right people that I believe are the right people. Um, and I'm able to, able to do this. When other people are looking in and they're like, wow, that's amazing. You're in Canada, what are you do? I'm just visiting my brother. Right. To me. But yes. Other people, that is a lifetime's, yeah. you know, saving or they, they've got to plan all this. So success for, for me is to look in the mirror. And am I happy with myself and what I'm doing? Yeah, I am. And that's why for you, Trav, I was saying like, to be able to run these podcasts on a long weekend mm -hmm. with buddies yeah. is to me like Travis's successful guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know. Well, you've had to work hard to get here. Like, that's the thing. You know, and, and I default to, and I should probably come up with my own definition of success, but I've yeah. always stolen uh, Earl Nightingale's because I've identified with it. And he says, success is a progressive realization of a worthy ideal. 
Yeah. It doesn't matter what you are. If you're the school teacher that loves teaching and your, uh, your worthy ideal is to help others and you're progressively working towards that. Uh, if you're the high flying entrepreneur or whatever, making a bunch of money, whatever that worthy ideal is to you, success is that progressive realization. And you know, it's, um, it's one of these things that, uh, I, money does uh, to a certain degree buy happiness. They've done studies and they say people need to eat. They yeah. need shelter. They need clothing. They need some basic necessities. They need climbing gear. They need climbing <laughs> gear, right? <laughs> uh, speaking of that, I might have some in my place. <laughs> Anyways. Um, I still have your hangboard. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Mounted in the ba- ba- in the bedroom. Um, yeah. We should probably tell people what the hangboard is that's mounted in your bedroom before they get some weird ideas. <laughs> it's for strengthening your hand grip. Right. And Trav bought it. So Trav is very um, passionate when he gets a new hobby. He went out and bought all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I've actually drilled. I should send a photo, but you want to be able to take weight off. Yeah, yeah. This isn't. So I have a pulley system hooked up. So I add 10, 15 pounds so I can hang or do mm-hmm. pull-ups. And it takes the weight off so you're not straining your ligaments. So I actually drilled... Um, a hook into the door frame because the hangboard's mounted above it yeah. with this pulley system. And my partner, Steffi, used to be number three in the world for bouldering in the outdoor circuit. And she hasn't trained to that level. She's a phenomenal climber. Yeah. But when I rigged this up in the pulley, she's like, well, I haven't thought I'd be training on a hangboard in years. <laughs> and it's there. So That's funny. Well, that's yours. You keep it. I it's too my... late now. Yeah. It is. I tore my, uh, what is it? Brachial radi- radialis, radial brachialis, uh, 250 pounds, just doing too many pull-ups, doing yeah. too many, and then that sets you back. So, and you know, Trav, to be honest, like the level that we were climbing at, you didn't need to train. I know. To hang on like that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know. I know. <laughs> all in or not at all. Yeah. Exactly. But that, um, that success piece is interesting. I had a dentist, Dr. Cren, growing up and, uh, um, they lived next to us, well, close to us. They, would, they had horses, I'd ride their horses. When I was a kid, I, uh, I was learning to swim in their pool. They've, uh, had a YMC come by, I almost drowned there. Three times in my life, I've almost drowned. And that was one of them. I got pulled out by my hair from the, uh, uh, the deep end. But, um, he always had, you know, the horses, the pool, the properties. He's like, Trav, whenever you want, just head down to Phoenix, went to into his place in Arizona and, um, check that out. I said, wow, what's it like to be rich? <laughs> he says, you know, the more money I make, the more bills you have. Yeah. It, it really, after a certain point and you have those necessities, money really doesn't mean anything. And you can always, and once you get that mindset, once you've earned and done something, it's easy to get back there because in your head, you've got that unlocked. It's just like climbing. Once you figure out a route, it's like, okay, it's easier and easier. I know how to do that route now. Cause for whatever reason you were stuck on that crux and you just couldn't get by it. But now, now it's unlocked. Life's kind of the same way I find once you reach those plateaus, but being able to differentiate once you find that little money portion and realize that there isn't a hell of a lot of happiness that's found there is a point of diminishing returns and what is it that brings, brings you joy. And so the mountains bring you joy, being surrounded by the people who are like-minded bring you joy. Um, well, I Trav, I did talk about like the robustness, right? That I, yes. I missed, but you know, um, you know, my mental health kind of, um, wasn't doing well in 2016, mm. 16, 17, really, um, and I can honestly say the mountains saved me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can relate climbing. Um, my mental health is reflected in my climbing. So if I'm leading, uh, lead climbing mm-hmm. and climbing in say tens or, or low elevens, mm-hmm. I'm on my game. Mm-hmm. If I have fear of falling, because we are protecting it and everything sure. else, then it definitely, I know I'm off my game. And what I've had to do then is just continue at a lower grade or top rope or second. Mm-hmm. But climbing is a um, direct correlation of where my mental health's at. And there's some studies coming out um, from UBC 
of some scientists studying that okay. and relating to it. Or there's always people doing studies and, and uh, I've partaked in a few of it. Sure. And I, I can say I can, you know, assess where I'm at with my mental health is where I'm at with my climbing grades. Right. And where I'm at. So I just know where I'm at in my game, you know. You know, I, I don't think I'm quite as fine tuned on that as you are, but I can definitely reflect the same. I know my pack feels a hell of a lot heavier when my head's not in the right place. I know I'm winded faster. I know my attitude sucks. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of getting a little bit of uh, warm liquids in you and getting a um, hard shell on and all of a sudden I'm warmed up a bit and everything goes from sort of a despondent feeling in your head, like you're out in the middle of nowhere and it's up to you to make sure you get yourself back to, okay, this is fine. I got it. I got it handled. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how much the mental health aspect impacts, um, the physical performance when you're, when you're pushing yourself, when you're pushing your boundaries. Well, we mentioned like trust, mm -hmm. right? So when you have PTSD or if you have, you're suffering in your mental health, you lose the ability to trust people, right? Like. Um, trusting yourself, trusting others, you lose that. Mm. And climbing, if you're in a two man rope team, a two person rope team, you're have to trust each other. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that intimacy, intimacy amongst the partners is there. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember this Lieutenant Vancouver fire. I just come in from climbing mm -hmm. before my night shift and Vancouver fire is big hockey group. Mm -hmm. Um, there's quite a few climbers in it too, but this Lieutenant kind of chirped at me and said, climbing is not a team sport. Mm -hmm. It's not like hockey, right? But, and I thought about that quite a bit. And in a way, he, I could see on the big level, it's not a team event, but mm -hmm. it is a team event because I could be guiding two clients. Mm -hmm. I could be ski guiding and have eight to 10 clients. Like if I'm working at Powder Mountain, the heli ski company mm -hmm. I work for, um, or have worked for, I could have 12 clients and a tail guide and a cat operator. We're a big team. We're all mm -hmm. a team from the clients to the ski guides, to the driver, to the other cat that's working there, to the heli team that's out as well. We're all one big team. Mm -hmm. So I could see, yeah, maybe on a hockey concept, it's not the same, but we're definitely operating as a team. Well, there's a certain point of the military as well and being British army that climbing brings back, because if you're on a hockey team and you don't have buddies back and you end up losing the game, everyone rasses you, go home, have a few drinks and try better the next time. If you're in the hills, you're in the mountains and you don't have buddies back and buddy doesn't have your back, it can have some pretty dire consequences. And yeah. that is, I, I think from my perspective, watching you, there's three things that I've seen. Number one is, uh, perhaps it's a bit of a replacement for the camaraderie and level of trust that you would find in the British army. No, I second that. Uh, second one would be, um, there's a forced presence that you start putting yourself into. So when people want to be present, they will sit down and they'll do their mantra and they'll ohm and they listen to their surroundings and they look at colors or they smell or what, whatever it is, they just try very hard to not be in the past, not be in the future, but be in the present. Well, climbing and being in the mountains forces you to be present in a way that, um, you have no other choice. If I'm not thinking about my next handhold, if you're not thinking about how you've placed your protection or your gear, or your clients, um, there are dire consequences. And I think from a PTSD standpoint, there's, I, I wonder I, if it's, I would think that it's healthy, but being able to, uh, differentiate or being able to use that presence experience as a, um, a segue to be able to do it without climbing. Cause otherwise number three comes and that's, if you can't find that level of presence without pushing yourself, then you're always going to be pushing those boundaries. And when you say when's enough, and when you say, you know, the, uh, the mountain saved you, there was a point Jace where I figured I was, you know, mentally preparing that, you know, maybe the idea behind the mountains were to push harder and harder and harder until such a point that it's, the mountains no longer save you. And that was, um, I, 
always one of those things that I, that I wondered if that was a driving factor and maybe it was at one point, but I sure don't think that is now. <laughs> and you know, Trav, like you, you talked about the present moment. Mm -hmm. Um, disassociation was, uh, a big problem for me. Um, mm -hmm. like I live in Squamish, I drive to Vancouver mm -hmm. for work with the fire, fire service. There's an hour there that would force me to disassociate. And then I'm not in the present moment and I'm back maybe in Iraq or I'm back in Afghanistan or I'm in a back, bad relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had to do many things to stay in the present moment. Um, so I wouldn't disassociate mm -hmm. because that would put me in some bad places. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a bad, you know, some of the bad calls I've had with the fire service or the sure. tech rescue team. Um, scent is very important, mm -hmm. really important scent to me. Um, one of them is, uh, when I came back 2009, I climbed, um, Wedge Mountain with Ada, mm -hmm. Ada Rabubi and, uh, I remember that. Mark Celeste, yes. who passed away this art tech, he was there with his team. So we were trying to meet him at the top, race him to the top. Mm -hmm. we, we got there, but I remember lavender, the smell of lavender. And it was in the, um, it was in the, uh, uh, Heather, the Heather mm -hmm. that was up in the Alpine and, and we went up to about 8,000 feet and, and yeah, we did. when we did our trip, didn't summit, but that's, that smell stayed with me, Travis, lavender. Mm. So one of the things I had to do was I bought this organic bar of lavender soap and I'd keep it in the car and, and, um, that would kind of ground me and keep me in the present. Um, to the point now I can, I, I can catch myself disassoci disassociating. I'm very aware of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, bring myself back. Often what I do now, I, I, I just have like talk shows like CBC, BBC. Yeah. I listen to podcasts. I tried to introduce Dean to some podcasts today. <laughs> um, but we're better chatting, lis listening yeah. to music. But you know, the, the far end of, of, uh, being in the present moment, um, what I like about the mountains is that it forces me in there. Mm -hmm. I remember we climbed, um, Steph and I climbed Selassie, mm -hmm. Chilliwack Peak. That's like a 28 pitches or something. Awesome. I've, yeah. I've only gone so far on that one, but that's. It definitely a, was a highlight. And we did a few years. We, we camped on the backside. We planned, we, we camped a propeller car because that airplane mm -hmm. crashed in in the sixties yep. and all the parts get brought in to this car and we camped below it, climbed the whole, the whole thing in one day and got in the backside. But on the drive out, I had a Tacoma at the time and, and, um, we're driving this really rough road and I, it was hot. It was dusty end of the climb and I'm driving down the road and we hit this washout mm -hmm. at full tilt and the front end goes up, comes down, bang. And I, Steph looked at me and I looked at her and I said, Steph, I wasn't here. I, I was in a Land Rover in Helmon province mm -hmm. driving down the road. Mm -hmm. Like I actually wasn't in my Tacoma with Steph after climbing Celesi, I was in Garmazir district mm -hmm. coming out from the gun line down into our fob, for example. Hmm. And when I, and what woke me up was hitting that. So that's how significant my disassociation was, right? Right. So, uh, that's why being in the mountains, for example, forces me to be in the present moment. And I love it mm -hmm. being in the present. And there's lots of things you can, you can keep yourself there too, right? Mm -hmm. Smells, sights, um, positive reinforcement, you know, views. And Dean, you've... You're into running as well, aren't you? Ultra running, yeah. Yeah. But it's similar to to Jason. When I um when I my father died twenty fourteen. I was out I was out here, but he had throat cancer. Um and then I come out, I'd done the the climbing and everything, and it was like, I need to find something. I need similar to Jason. It wasn't about saving me. It was about I need to do something for me. I don't feel I fit anywhere. Mm. I've come out now, I've done a few little jobs. What am I doing? What, where is my next move? What, you know, what, what's life got in for me? Mm. So then I went online, typed in adventure race and the Squamish 5050 come up. And I was like, what the hell? Really? So I watched this video by the ginger runner. And, um, and I remember that when they, it was on, Jason said to me, he says, oh, we're going to get out of town. The zombies are coming in. I was like, what? He says, yeah, it's a, it's a festival or something going on. Um, so we, we went out of town, but it was the 50-50. Mm. So I watched this video and then straight after I went onto the website and I went, book, 
and I booked the 50-50, not just the 25K, the 50 miles the first day, then the 50K the second day. Yes. Not having run since I was in the army. So now I'm sat here behind this computer going, I need to run. I need to get out running. Mm -hmm. So I just started with 5K, 10K, half marathon, marathon. And then I got in with um, some folks down in Dartmoor called Pure Trail, and they run running events. Um, and then on a Wednesday, they had a group running. So if I was down that area, because I've got family in Plymouth, I would then go meet them on the moor, go running with them. Um, and then I'd done the Plym Plymouth um, Marathon, which is down a bike track, then up the bike track. But it's a real nice, okay. down through the hills and old railway track. So I started making friends and then like, oh, we're running this one and this one. So it's like, oh, I'll meet up and you get your camp, you get your tent out, you, you fire in the nighttime, you sit talking about the race and then you go off. The thing about ultra running is it was a couple of things. So it was seeing the things and the journey as you run. And a lot of people think when you say ultra running, it's like what you ran for 16 hours. No, it took me 16 hours to cover 70 miles. Mm. But there were eight aid stations along that way. Mm -hmm. So you stop, you have a bite to eat if you need to. You have five, ten minutes. If you've got a crew, like at Skarmish 50-50, I had um, Jason and his uh, Dennis, our friend. Yeah. Um, and they give you that bit of a push. Because there's sometimes when you're on that trail, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Why did I book this? And you question not just your ability, but you question yourself. It's... Can I do this? Mm -hmm. What am I thinking? I'll be easy if I just get off now and finish. Mm -hmm. Just that's it. I shouldn't be here. Look at these other people. Right. But with trail running, everybody has a story on that trail. They're not running because they just love running. They have a story that's brought them to trail running and the ultra the ultramarathon scene. Um, and then the ones that are good at it, fantastic. And they, but they've still got time for you. Mm -hmm. So I remember twenty sixteen when I, I ran the first time, uh, Dakota Jones is a big time runner and he came and he won the man's race, the men's race. Um, but I was stood there talking to him and he's a young lad mm. still, but he, they have the time, they live in vans. Right. They haven't got big houses. They just, right. they're in vans and they love running and they love, they're passionate about what they do. So I was like, this is brilliant. So like yourself, I pop back, I start buying all the kit. I'm brilliant, right? I need this, I need that. I'm like, right, what's he wearing? Right, I need to pair of them. Right. And it's like, oh, they're wearing them shoes and everything. But it's like, you don't. You don't need it. And you never really do. You don't need it. You could just put a pair of daps on that work all right for you. You could go out with some tennis shorts on and a cotton t-shirt. Yeah. I don't need the top brand or you know the, the running vests and all the the, the days so there's certain races where you have to have certain stuff sure like a you know a warm blanket you know hydration food mm -hmm. a whistle you know uh, if you get lost but it was just that pureness of just running in nature that gave me that sense of belonging i had found my peer group along with climbing it was ultra running so now when I have my moments, I put on a pair of trainers and I get out the door because the endorphins spike because mm. I'm doing exercise and then I feel fantastic about it. Mm. And I'm like, yes, brilliant. And that's the thing with the ultra is it's that it's a very long spike mm. when you do. So the biggest race I've done was 70 miles in 16 hours. Uh, and when you've ran that, and then you stop and you've been running with other people. You just say, did we just do that? And wow. sometimes I say, you know, like Jason pushes me when we're climbing and I thank him for it. Mm -hmm. It's like, right, we're, like most of this last trip down at Scarhart was about technique turning and hips and all this. And I'm like, I'm not dancing, Jason. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but if you do this, watch. And then it's like, and then you do it. And it's like, I've just reached two inches higher. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a ledge there. I've been just been dancing like a turkey on this ledge for 20 minutes trying to work <laughs> it out. And, and Jason's like, yeah, there's no point dancing. You need to get up there. Hmm. I forgot. So one of our goals, old Trav, is um, our goal is on, we're going to head up to Marble Canyon. 
Okay. And there's a 20 pitch climb there called the goat. Okay. So. That's what we call each other. The goat. My mate, the goat. My mate, the goat. <laughs> Greatest so, of all time. And we actually started our first climbing trip up there. And we, I was building resume to be a, a rock guide. And we, uh, we had a moment on the rock where I'm pushing it. Dean's at his complete comfort zone limit. And we had a good heart to heart. Yeah. And then I had to dial it back and everything. But I would love to go back now on Wednesday, mm. go up there. And it's only 20 pitches. The highest is 5'9", but I would love to be able to bring Dean back to that. Mm. where we started and this 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 route wasn't in there when we first went there mm. it's a bolted 20 pitch alpine climb so that's why i've been really focusing on the technique with him because i'd like to get him on the goat what do you before think he goes that? back i'm ready yeah yeah so this is so Mar um marble canyon was when we had pulled in to to put up, set up camp and everything and there was this young lady and her partner from down in America. And she, she's talking away. And I said, oh, he's a climber. Like, this is my first time out. So, oh, Jason's a climber. She says, have you climbed? I said, I've done a little bit in, in um, Squamish on the bluffs and everything. I said, yeah. So I've done a little bit of climbing. She goes, you're a climber then? Right. I was like, yeah, I guess I am then. Yeah. But it's because you look at somebody at a level and you think, well, I'm nothing like that. But you're, doesn't, you, it's not about the level. If you participate in that and that then becomes your passion, that's what you are. I like that. I like it doesn't that. Matter. It, it doesn't matter if I, he climbs better than me. Hmm. It's about taking part and that, yeah, I got up on the rock and I climbed. Well, it's like you, Dean, like you're a runner. Yeah. Having that, the winner of the 50. Yeah, but not the two days. No. I've still got to come back. There's you a, so, come back. <laughs> there's, um, so the Squamish 50 feet, I've entered twice, but I've never done the second day. Okay. So I've woke up with aches yeah, yeah. and my head's telling me I'm injured. I've got blisters on my feet and everything else like that. I yeah. can't get from that bed to the start line and start walking on the next day. Because of head or because of feet and legs? and I think it's all of it. Yeah. But my head gets the better part of me. And then that's that, right? Yeah, you, you're out of your league, mate. But to be fair, Dean, that one time... He had Gore-Tex runners. He had Gore-Tex runners. Oh, when I went. It was hot. Remember it was the uh, heat wave that's hit the first, August? That's the you first one. Yeah, those? the first, first one. one. And then uh, he'd come around and, he, and Dennis and I are at the checkpoint. Yeah. And he's like, it was awesome, mate. I sat in this creek to cool off and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so his Gore-Tex runners are soaked. Yeah. So I think had we switched out of shoes, your feet, but that totally hamburgered his feet. Mm about halfway along. I think if we had switched out runners and stuff and you weren't in the Gore-Tex shoes. So that definitely. Yeah, that was, yeah. But okay. the creek must have felt great. It was fantastic, mate. <laughs> <laughs> My legs were burning. There's, there's yeah. a part on it. Next caught. time, do it so your feet are yeah. <laughs> out. Well, there's a part. It's, I can't remember what it's called, the escalator part, and it goes yeah. up. Me, me and Jason wrecked it, but it goes up for like over a mile, maybe a little bit more. Um, and by the time you get up into the clouds in the mountain, it's like, God, oh, that's all. So my legs were like solid and pumping. I was like, right. and I saw this creek. I was like, I'm getting in that. Definitely. That's me. <laughs> Windhoff, here you go. So I'm sat in it. I'm like, oh, up there. That's fantastic. Right. I better get on running. So as you're running, you're like, my feet are burning. Why are my feet burning? <laughs> oh, I've just no. been in the water. Oh, no. And it's like, because you're just rubbing. Yeah. yeah, and I'm yeah. coming down, and they're all mountain bike tracks. It's not a road, yeah. uh, a trail. It's mm. a mountain bike track. So you're bouncing off rock, and of course, then I didn't really know how to run properly. It's crazy. People, you're like, you run properly? Yeah, there's a way to run down hills, mate. Okay, you know, if you put your arms out and balance, yeah, and then let your legs go, you go. So what that helps is stops you pushing as you're running down a hill. If you're if you're doing that, yeah, your knees doing your knees doing this. Right. Where if you kick your legs out and go with the hill, yeah. exactly as if somebody was on a mountain bike going down, if there's a burn goes that way, you go that way. And Lean down. into it. Really? But you keep yeah. your hands out and use it as balance. So when people see all these big runners coming down and they've got cuts all over, they've tumbled mm. because they've let their self go rather than slowing down, which then puts that on the joint, mm -hmm. on the knees, go with the flow. So the first year I'm like, oh, step, step. Oh, I was like, my knees, mate. I'm can't yeah this is hurting whereas the second year and i took a hour off the second year 
That's Time-wise. substantial. Yeah, so the first year was 14 hours 30, and then the second was 13 hours 30-something. And I was like, I come in, and I was like looking at the clock, and I said, I've took an hour off. You would have thought I won the whole thing because I started <laughs> shouting and screaming. <laughs> I'm looking at Jason and Chris like, I've took an hour off. Look at that time. Wow. And he's like, yeah, but you've got another day to go. Oh, yeah. I might have just pushed that a little bit yeah. too hard. So the 50, I don't know, Travis, but if you know, it's one of the robust races because of the hills and the trails. I haven't done it. I've yeah. been in the area and I've seen people who've done it. That's, yeah. I, I, I did go through a phase uh, uh, about 2016. For me, it's, it's we call it the hump season. So for, it's between the rock and the ski season. So mm. October, November is my worst season. Put weight on, maybe <laughs> too much beer or whatever. But in September, I told Dina, I'm going to run the 50K with you the next day. That was my plan. Mm -hmm. I remember this. Yeah. So I started trail running. Yep. I, I was up to about 30K. This is where you ran into the bear as well. I remember that. Well, that story. was with oh, Dean that's when we training. Done a training, yeah. but I I was running. Maybe I went, you know, over two three months. I got myself up to about thirty k maximum, and then one day, one day, my hamstring spasmed, mm. knee pain, and that was me done. You're like, that's it. Not worth it. That was I'm it. Out. Ski season rolled in, but I just think I did maybe too much over that time in that three months training for it. Knowing you, you did. Yeah, but I that was my goal was to get him on the 50K line the next day mm. and run it with him, but it just never worked out. And now I actually, to be honest, don't have any ambition. Right? <laughs> Maybe I'll volunteer, but that's, yeah. That's Jack, because I was thinking yeah. we could do it next year. Yeah, no. I got to do my Alpine guide exam. Okay. But, um, yeah. So uh, I, I got two different questions here. One's an observation. I remember uh, you, me, Dennis, were out in... Um, Oh, what was it? Was it Mount Beautiful? Do you remember that? Oh, Long yes. time ago? Yeah. And, and someone says, Trav, you got to try these Danner boots out. They're the best. And I'm, that, that was a mistake. N never trust somebody when they say these boots are the best. Maybe for them. Yeah. Right? Maybe these socks are great for you. Everyone's built a little bit differently. Anyways, my boots are just full of blood by the end of that one. But I remember you were recently back off of doing... Um, SAS selection. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I can't complain. I, 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 this guy is going to be just a machine out there and I got to keep going. But one thing that really surprised me was, um, you kept a steady pace, not necessarily a breakneck fast pace, but the pace was just constant. And anytime Dennis, Dennis is like, oh, I got a rock in the boot. You're like, Dennis, stop, sort yourself out, administer your boots, then get up and let's get going again. And it was a very different mentality than what I'd ever kind of allowed myself to have in the past. I was always like, well, if you're, if you're hurt, you just keep going. If, um, if you're wet, just keep plugging through, just go faster. If you're cold, you'll warm up. Um, but the amount of distance set on subsequent trips that we'd go out on that we're able to cover comfortably in a short period of time by just taking that approach of a uh, reasonable pace sorting yourself out, fuel yourself up when you need it, take care of the feet when you need it. Uh, so that, that was my, um, sort of observation. And that was one of the, the big things I learned from you and how to be able to, uh, push yourself further than you figured you're able to go is by making sure that you take care of all of those little things in a progressive way. So that's my observation. The question I have though, and I'll pose it to both of you. So Dean, ultra running. And you get to that point and you're like, what the hell am I doing? My feet hurt. My legs hurt. It's cold. I'm tired. How do you push through that? When you've got about four miles to go to the finish line, it's easier to keep going and finish and get over that line than it is to turn around and walk the miles you've just done. Okay. And it's that mindset. I was, yeah. Crack on. But that's also the beginning too. I think the yeah. first few miles is the hardest too. Yeah. Because well, your body's going, you why don't am I doing this? Until, until yeah. you warm up, mm. until you get going and that engine's then right, it's in that cycle. And it's like, yeah, I got this. The body's doing that, but then the head kicks in. Right. It wants to do different to what your body's doing. Right. So to push through that, I think it's, it's, it's the same... I take it from the same sort of mentality when I was in, in the forces. 
when you take a position, you push through that position. Mm. So you take it, you've got your goal, now you push on because there's another goal. Mm -hmm. If we stop short, you're in a killing area or, mm -hmm. or a beating zone, or you've got to keep going. Mm -hmm. Even if my leg, I've got to crawl, mm -hmm. I've got to walk. And that was the thing through training is you'd always have a wagon behind you. It's called the jack wagon or the ambulance. Yeah. So if you in, so you get a lot of people, oh, I can't do this, get on the wagon. Mm. So there's always something behind you that would you could go, oh, I can't do this. I can get on that wagon. It's warm. Get a coffee and they'll carry on going. Right. You don't have that when you're running. Right. You've got to finish. Jason, how do you get through it? I remember us talking about it on the first podcast about that. Okay. About that day. And and it's interesting now, um, like say as a ski guide, like Black Home, everyone goes out the back gate and they either go to East Call or they go to Guides Notch. Mm. And it, it's a rat race. Mm -hmm. And they follow the same up track and it's icy and everything else. I usually put my own up track in now. Mm -hmm. And the perfect guide pace is 11 degrees okay. trail. Yeah. And that's the most efficient output that you can climb out to be efficiency degrees. without burning out. Okay. The other tracks that go straight up are called the Revy tracks, Revelstoke mm -hmm. tracks where they, they go straight up. I really love putting in this 11 degree track and it's longer, but you cover more kilometers overall through the day, but then you start passing everybody mm. and you're not tired and you see them because they just do these up rest. They go straight up, then they rest and they straight right. up and they rest, right? So um, what draws me to this trav for me is I am drawn to adversity. Mm. I remember being say, um, I'll use Brecken, mm. senior Brecken. And I think I talked about it where we're leading, we're, we're heading out for an exercise and my Bergen weighs so much that I have to sit on the parade square. Mm. and roll over onto my knees to stand up, get, to get on the truck. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to do a 16 kilometer in, uh, insertion tab or tackle. That's the battle. Yeah. And, um, I remember that thinking that not a lot of people are doing this <laughs> for good reason. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. But I was drawn to doing stuff that most people don't want to do or can't do. Why? For me, uh, it's coming back to that adversity. Like it really comes down to, um, challenging myself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the self efficiency, finding ways, like for example, teaching Dean now, like when Dean came 2014, I wasn't that good of a climber either. I, I couldn't really coach him mm. because I wasn't that good of a climber, but now I can to say it's more efficient and less effort to, to do this, the twist lock, for example, versus doing a pull up the mm -hmm. whole way up. So it's that self-efficiency, finding what is the most efficient way to do, um, and carry it out. Um, you know, like the grit. So it's interesting when you think about what drives people. So we should do a podcast one day about my accident in Spain, where I fell, mm -hmm. broke my back, my foot my wrist and my what? ribs. We could talk about it right now. Well, I think it's a podcast in its own, but long story short, I was going to repel to the ground, mm. but I had my friend lowered me because I remember how much when you do that tandem rescue repel together, mm -hmm. how much movement I had. It was better for my back. Right. So he lowered me right away. I had to down climb and scramble out and walk two, three kilometers while he got the car. Mm. Um, when I was... Squamish SAR, search and rescue, I remember having to carry a patient off with a broken toe. Mm. And we carried her down all the way from peak three <laughs> or two. Yes. Lowered and carried her down. Yes. So everyone has different levels, right? Of Where course. Some people just um, throw it in. Mm -hmm. Others rise to that occasion, right? So mm -hmm. for me, it's that challenge and the adversity that drives me to that next level. And then I think like Dean's alluded to a lot of it, um, you know, that personal growth, right? There's that growth of in yourself, like that trust, but also um, what your limits are, knowing when's enough enough, or do I have more in myself? Or maybe if I was more efficient, I could push myself 
to that next level, mm-hmm. right? In that versus hitting it like a bull full on, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah, for me, it's that. Knowing your limits. You know, when I was a teenager, all these no fear t-shirts were really uh, big. Yeah. You remember those? And I always thought, I want to make a t-shirt. I bet you it'd be a hot seller. It says, know your limits, but N-O, your limits. Yeah. I've never seen anyone do that. Maybe by now someone has, but. Maybe we have something. There you go, yeah. Know your limits, right? (laughs) Say no to your limits. Yeah. Um, But there's ways you can affect that too, like training, fitness. Like I know, um, so I'm coming off ski season hmm. and I didn't, I'm, I'm, I'm very objective based. So ski guide was my, my ski guide exam in March was priority. Hmm. I knew I have rock and alpine coming up. I didn't really tick over in the gym. I'm just like ski, 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 ski. Mm. Now rock season started say a month ago and Steph and I went out climbing and I was like, oh my goodness, I, I need to get back in the gym. <laughs> and just within a month climbing, what roots that were shutting me down uh, with Steph, Dean and I just onsighted them. I guess it'd be a red point because I've climbed, climbed them before. Sure. But I was just like, climbed one of them back down and went straight on the other one mm. where I had to work them with Steph. So, and that's only a month of just doing the baseline. You, you flashed know, them. The, yeah, flashed the strength them. training in the gym, not right. climbing base, just strength, like mm-hmm. squats, deadlifts, bench press, bent over row, pull-ups. And what that month of training does. I mean, I'm, and I find, you know, with the podcast, you get all different people emailing and contacting and DMing and all, whole different backgrounds. And one thing that seems to be coming up over and over again is this whole mental health thing. And I'm learning a whole bunch about mental health in the process and everyone's got mental health problems to some degree or another. When you're talking about the woman who's got the stubbed toe or the broken toe and carried her down, you know, maybe that was incapacitating for her. Who are we to judge, right? Everyone's got different, different levels and, you know, oftentimes people get competitive in the, uh, well, you've got mental health. What, what do you go through? What, what do you, well, I've been through worse. And then they've done studies. They've done studies that show how like mothers that have lost their children and the brain waves and what the brain looks like and how the trauma affects them. And people who don't have that experience, but they have the exact same trauma or brain waves in the, in their head as, as somebody who had something that was arguably more, um, impactful or traumatic by, by most people looking out. Um, everybody's going to have a different perspective on things on the, on the mental health side. Everyone's got, uh, different levels. I know in past podcasts, we talked about the guy who got PTSD from eating a chocolate bar. Have you eaten, have you heard this one? No. No. So this guy goes in and, uh, convenience store, buys a chocolate bar, eats half of it, looks down like, oh, a scarf in this thing. And it's got maggots in this thing. That's disgusting, right? Tells the clerk, clerk says, Sorry, sorry, sorry. Here's a refund. You can have a free bar if you want, right? On he goes. But then the guy goes home and he starts thinking about eating chocolate bars with maggots and he starts having nightmares about eating maggots in his, in his food. And then he can't go to church anymore because he figures they're all going to laugh at him for eating the chocolate bar with the maggots. And he starts exhibiting avoidance tendencies and recurring thoughts and uh, all of these things that are typically associated with with PTSD from, from eating a chocolate bar with maggots, something that I don't know, all three of us would probably have done at some point and thought nothing else of, right? But that's yeah. trauma to him, isn't it? Yeah. That's right. And that's the interesting thing I find, uh, and it's going to circle back to like, how do you push through? But, um, that's the interesting thing that I find when we talk about mental health is it really doesn't matter at what place you are in fortune's wheel and what rung you are on the ladder of it. It's, it seems to be the acceptance of those around you that support network, right? If it's viewed as a socially unacceptable thing, then, uh, perhaps your own perception of it is going to be worse. And, uh, an absolutely natural event that happens to everybody, yet people stigmatize it as if it's, it's like, if you got cut and you're bleeding, People would say, put a bandaid on that thing. Or geez, that looks deep. Let's stitch it up in a couple of weeks. You'll be good to go. We'll take those stitches out. There's a process in place. But when it comes to mental health, um, 
I, I still think we're far ways away from people having that level of understanding as to, uh, to how to deal with it or just accepting it. I, I think with that is in the old days, it was a taboo. Sure. Mental still is health, in some yeah. ways. Yeah. So, so mental health was like, you're a nut job. Mm. Men don't have mental health problems. You're strong. You're the alpha. You gather, you go to work, you come home mm -hmm. and then you do the home stuff. So I think for a very long time, there was that taboo about talking about your feelings. Mm. A lot of the programs on TV, social media wasn't around that, but a lot of the programs on TV, like the A-Team, Airwolf, there's these male figures that are saving people's lives. Mm -hmm. So as a child, you're sitting there, you're watching that, and it's like, that's what a man is. Mm. You know, he, he gets shot, but he's not crying. Mm. He falls over, he's not crying. Mm. You know, they're helping people, you know, mm -hmm. he's strong like the Hulk. Yeah. So we had a lot of these images and, you know, programs that we used to watch where we didn't have that. And, um, whereas now we sit here and we can talk about mental health. There's other podcasts, there's people talking about it, but I agree with you that isn't, there still isn't enough because it comes down to like people getting help it comes down to funding. Where's the money for the mental health? Because they'll go, well, we've got these other things we need to deal with first. But you, you can't, mental health should be one of the priorities. Right. Because if, if we, you'll never solve it. So, but for me, I'm not talking about everybody. Sure. And for Chris, you know, I've helped Chris, our friend for a long time. It's about managing it. When you know you have this PTSD or anxiety or depression and everything else, like, it's about managing that you'll always have it mm. it doesn't go away mm -hmm. it's there mm -hmm. we just now need to learn how to manage it whether it's ultra running mm -hmm. or it's being in the mountains climbing for jason and doing his guiding you know so the taboo in the old days is what we need to wash out and the mental health is it's not somebody in a white jacket that's getting taken away mm -hmm. it's this yeah i've had a bad day yesterday We'll talk about it. And and I had a moment with, oh, I'm going to be open here. I had a moment with Jason down at Skaha. We were climbing. Um, I think it was a five, five, eight, five, nine. Was it Mother Superior? I think it might have been. Yeah. Maybe um, it's and I, I got on it and I got to this point and the head slipped in. Mm. You can't do this. What are you doing? Mm. And I'm looking, I can't see the hold. Can't see it. What, what am I doing? Come all the way out to Canada, I'm making a fool of myself. Mm. What, what am I doing? You said something, didn't you? And, and I think I, I found it and I got up and then I come down. But I come down and he just looked at me and I just sat there and I was just staring out. He says, you all right? Just start, I just started crying. Mm. I don't know why. Mm. I just... I just had this moment where it was like I wasn't happy with what I did up there or something or my head turned around and said to me, get down, this isn't, you shouldn't be doing this. Right. You know, this is a 5'9 or 5'8 mm. or what, you know, the hold isn't here, you can't see it. Just just get down. You're trying to live somebody else's life or something. Mm. But I just sat there and uh, and he's just like, he says, no, take your time. Sure. He says, it's all right, I'll just sort the rope out and everything, take your time. Yeah. you know and i just and i just sat there and i'm like i don't know why i am crying i've got nothing to cry about mm. i'm not full balling but i've got tears sure. running down my eyes and i'm like what why i got overcome with the moment interesting i've got nothing to cry about it's um if, if someone's feeling that way they have something well they're crying for a reason there's there's a reason for yeah. it right and it's um i it kind of reminds me years ago, argument with my wife. We're talking, I don't even know what it was, right? And uh, I'm like, how can't you see you're wrong, right? Like, like in my head, like I could fix this. And like the typical me, here's this and here's why and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, you know what? You're right, but it doesn't change, it doesn't change the way I feel, right? Yeah. It's like, huh. And that's the first time I ever looked at it and I thought, well, yeah, okay, well, I guess then we address why you feel that way. And maybe there's, there's more to look at it. 
and when it comes to the stigma associated with mental health, you know, I, I see both sides. The one side, the A team, the Hulk, you got to be strong and you got to push through and you never have a problem. And the other side, um, is, uh, delving too far into it and then identifying with that and saying, well, I'm, I'm Bob with PTSD. I'm, I'm Joe with whatever it might be. And that becomes your label and your crutch that you always fall back on. And I think the more that, because you'd never say I, I'm Bob with the foot injury, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you'd say, yeah, I had a foot injury. If it comes up from time to time, I can still feel it, but here's, here's what I do to manage it. Yeah. Um, and you don't identify as that. And I, and I think that's a, I think that's a key part for people in being able to deal with it is surround themselves with others who can accept just like Jason there. Yeah, I get it. Whatever. Well, let's work through we'll, whatever the reason might be. And, uh, let's plug on. We still got a job to do. We still yeah. got things to do. And that that mindset is not succumbing to the illness and thinking like, this is all too overwhelming. It's like, okay, this is, this is a natural part of the process. Oh, I got up the next one, didn't I? Well, and that's what I talk about. Like if I'm, if my mental health is suffering and I realize I don't have the capacity for it, mm. I just bring the grades back mm -hmm. or I top rope or I have Steph rope gun mm -hmm. and I'm second. And cause that is for me working through it. Mm -hmm. because knowing that my resilience, so we call it your window of tolerance. Okay. Your window of tolerance is narrowed, right? So things for me like hunger, lack of sleep, um, anger, whatever, they can just contributing factors for, uh, window of tolerance. Say mm -hmm. for example, um, like commuting Squamish to Vancouver and you, all of a sudden you're getting road rage, for example, mm -hmm. right? Cause your window of tolerance is so limited, mm -hmm. right? Things that affect it. So for me, um, knowing that my window of tolerance is limited, I still want to go out. I still want to climb. I just dial it back. So that's humbling mm -hmm. for me because I would still push that in the past, but now I just dial it back and go, I'm just in the present, I'm in the moment and it's good to be here. Yeah. Because the alter alternative to that is you just don't go out. Yes. And then that perpetuates itself and it's a compounding issue. There is a, um, uh, there's a fellow, he's a past podcast guest and I was talking to him on, uh, Christmas day and he says, we're texting back and forth and I said, well, how are you doing? He's like, oh, not too good. What's going on? He says, one of, um, one of the people that follows him on social media, uh, decided to, uh, try and take his own life. They're going to see how he's doing and how he's making out and. Uh, shot himself, shot himself in the, in the head and, uh, I guess under the chin and, uh, uh, this fellow ended up surviving, um, a Canadian forces, uh, sniper, I believe it was, uh, this fellow now, uh, the fellow who shot himself, he's very open about it and he's on social media and he says, you know, in the back of my head, I just, right before I pulled the trigger, I heard this voice that says, change the angle. And he did, he slightly changed the angle and he looks like he's lost his eye and uh, has a hard time talking now. He survived and he says, you know, the second he pulled the trigger, immediately regretted it. And he's trying to self-rescue and he's calling up 9-11 and he's spitting out teeth and trying to coordinate on his location. And, uh, he says, you know, the best thing that I could tell anybody is, you know, just stop, reassess you will regret it. Um, now looking at how that impacts other people, I think Jordan Peterson says, never underestimate the hole your absence will leave in other people's lives. Um, the individual who I was, uh, past podcast guest with, uh, does a uh, weekly mental health walks. They just get out into the woods, they get out into a park. It's not a race. The guy's uber fit. Uh, but it's just, everyone come on up. We'll have a little bit of a, uh, a chat ahead of time. We'll go for a walk and there's a, uh, there is a, it's interesting looking at how people being able to share their stories just like this, uh, reaches others and can affect a positive change that has ripples that, uh, go, go well beyond them. So I, I, yeah. That's that belonging. 
Huh. If you look at it all, it all comes down to belonging. I agree. It, into a point. It's like, you know, this opportunity is here because, you know, we're, we're friends and, but we like to be, be in that circle. You know, mm -hmm. if I didn't want like you and we didn't get on, I would be like, hey, Chase, you go and do that. It's like, right. but this guy does stuff that I like. I'm following him and, you know, it's that sort of stuff. And it's the same with your man's there saying, right, let's go for a run. Just a, or a walk. It's mm -hmm. just a walk. Just a walk. We'll all talk. But it it's that now, oh, belonging to something. Mm -hmm. That's a walking group with people that share the similar sort of issues maybe, or somebody's worse, somebody's like, but they now belong to something. Mm -hmm. Jason belongs to a community and a very small one. By the time he's finished and he's got every qualifications going, mm -hmm. it's like a real small one, but he belongs to a community. Mm -hmm. I belong, you know, I dabble in a couple of communities, but I belong to a community. I have... I have for me, I have a reason to keep going forward. Not just my son, you know, uh, um, well, both my boys. Um, it's for me, you've got to have something for yourself as well. Mm. You know, when you've got children, they're your priorities. But when it's mm -hmm. you as an individual, if you're not running or working at, at that maximum or at that level where it's good for you, that affects behind you. Mm -hmm. So if it means I have to go out for a walk with this guy in this group, I now belong to this group and I feel a bit better about myself because I'm having conversations and chats like we are now. You're like, I'll walk out here and I'll walk on tippy toes to speak. Sure. Because it felt good to sit here and have that conversation. Yes. With like, it's guys, you know, we wouldn't do this normally in no. the old days. And Nor that, publicly like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's that. It's belonging to community. So when people start you know, getting in contact with you on, on social media. Hey, you know, this podcast, blah, blah, blah. It was brilliant. I like this guy because he touched on that and everything. But they belong to your podcast and your community. And mm -hmm. we all belong to something. And it's that with mental health. If, if we can, people belong here. I don't want people to take their lives. Mm. As hard as it gets, everybody has a reason for being on this planet. Mm. You've just not found it yet, or you're just not with the right tribe or group where you belong. And that level of belonging, it, it reminds me of, um, Crocodile Dundee when they're talking about, uh, a shrink and, uh, I think they're in New York and shrink, what's that, right? Psychiatrist, what do they do? Oh, you know, you pay them money, you sit down, they tell them their problems and they help you through it and you see them every week or, or whatever it is, right? Don't you have anything like that? And. In where is he from? Walkabout Creek. <laughs> and he says, oh no, we got, I forget the guy's name, Bruce, the bartender. He tell Bruce your problems. Bruce tells everybody else, no more problem. <laughs> right? He's passed, passed on. But, on. but that level of understanding, shared understanding so much, so often people just get it in their head and they're carrying it all by themselves. And that level of belonging that you talk about, whether it's with the, the mountain groups or the marathon runners or whatever it might be, uh, is bigger than you. And it allows, I, I was asked to do, uh, a talk and I'm still debating whether I'll do it or not. And I've just kind of been thinking in the back of my head about, um, uh, what I'll talk on, but, uh, it's essentially it's, it's along the lines of mental health, um, that they've, they've asked for. And, uh, one of the concepts that I was thinking of, everyone says, oh, you got to work on yourself, right? You got to take care of yourself. You got to work on yourself and you can't help others until you help yourself. And I think, well, yes, to a degree, but quite often the, the one thing that's going to help you more than anything else is being of service to others in some small degree or another, being able to help others will bring you a level of value that you might not be able to find if all you're doing is concentrating on yourself and your own issues. Um, I haven't got that one dialed in yet, but I'd be interested to hear what your guys' thoughts are. Well, you know, Trav, um, I've, uh, worked the last few years as a heli ski guide mm. and, and a mechanized cat guide. And, um, I struggled with what my role was. I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, I understand the touring ski guide and you're in the moment and you're taking a group out. Um, but the heli ski guiding, I'm just like, what, this is kind of 
how am I helping these people? This is, these are even smaller than the 1%, mm -hmm. right? What am I trying to get out of this? Like, how can I maybe help facilitate them? Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a friend up in, in Whistler and uh, he's a trauma counselor and I was chatting with him about it. And he said, Jay, like your connection you make, cause this is just a one day operation. This connection you make with these clients, you don't know what their role is. You don't know what they're, where they're coming from. You don't know where they're going. You don't know what they're going through, but that connection you make with them that day will influence and affect them mm -hmm. positively or maybe negatively. Right. And I thought about that and I took away from that. And then, um, I think this one time we're waiting to get picked up for the heli and I'm connecting with this gentleman from Australia of all things. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him, you know, like my journey from the military, the fire service, working in adventure therapy with outward bound veterans, maybe looking at my own program for first responders, um, where my journey's taken me mm -hmm. and that, and the connection I had. And it, it hit something with him. I think I exchanged details with him and I got an email from him maybe six months later. He's like, Jay, I, I, that day we spent together was phenomenal. Um, I wasn't doing that well. Uh, but just to let you know, like I'm a CEO of a company that has over 300 employees. Mm. And that day we spent was able for me to go back, maybe get the help he needed, but he was able to keep going, keep everyone employed, keep the company going. Wow. Um, and that actually hit home for me. Like that one day, that one moment, that connection with that individual um, is purpose, mm -hmm. right? And it could be that seven days in a lodge, or it could be that one day, um, on a backcountry ski tour, or it could be, um, on a bus. And we were talking about, you and I talked about that, um, gentleman that you said were, you know, he, at the last minute said, um, aim off, right. you know, right. injury. And I said, it's interesting because you and I chatted just before that I had watched something on YouTube about a kid who took the bus to the um, Golden Gate Bridge mm. and he was crying on the bus and people were making fun of him. Not anyone checked in with him and said, what's going on? Got off the bus and jumped off. And right. the moment he jumped, he's like, I made a mistake and he survived. Right. But he was a mess, right? Mm -hmm. But not a single person on the bus showed him any empathy, compassion. Nobody checked in with him. So we don't know where this moment connection is going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be that person on the bus. It could be um, the client. It could be that um, follower on Instagram. Sure. Right. So you just don't know where mm -hmm. it's coming or where it's going. I agree. Victor Frankel, he was the father of modern logotherapy. You guys have heard of him? No, if it's in a book, not me. Okay. He wrote a book called <laughs> Man's Search for Meaning, I think it was called. Just to interrupt here though, I am um, so impressed with Travis is able to remember like the title, the phrase. <laughs> it is. We're talking about some it. Like, I, rem I can get some stuff down, but Travis is just like author, book, and then boom. Yeah, boom. Ha have me remember a name right after I meet you. Come yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> we had this chat in the uh, in the truck coming up here about yeah. books. Sorry, Travis, we interrupted yeah. you though, but, but, yeah. but books, yeah. Books I, you don't do? No, I'll get, and then that's it. Never? I, in my head, I'm just like, I can't carry on. All Does life it, like that or whole since? Whole life. Okay. Whole life like that. Whereas, show me, video. Yeah. YouTube or do it and I'll do it or I'll remember it. See, I, I'm very much a do it. You can show me, you can tell me, you can, and until I do it, even as a kid, Travis, don't touch that stove. It's hot. Like how hot? Like, what do you mean by hot? Let me see. Oh, that's what you mean by hot. Got it. Right. I remember as a kid, I stuck my hand into a, um, uh, an electric popcorn machine, but not a hot air one. It heated up oil inside there oh. and you put your stuff in there and I had, um, uh, and blisters all up and down my arms and I'm surprised I don't have big scabby scars on my arms. I guess I'm a good healer, but, um, I, I have to always been that way. I have to do it myself. You can tell me till you're blue in the face, right? Jace could be like, okay, Trav, just your handle like this, pivot like that. And. I actually have to do it myself before it'll ever sink in. Just dense like that, I guess. I wouldn't say dense. 
We've all got a little different capacity, haven't we? Different, exactly. Yeah. Some people are at the front of the train, some people are at the back, but we're all moving along, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, with the uh, Victor Frankel fellow, so atrocities, concentration camps he was in, uh, and he took it from an analytical perspective, well, everyone, his family's dying, his friends are dying, his surrounded by people who've got everything taken from them. And some people can't even get out of bed. Some people are just beside themselves of grief and other people are even able to crack a joke or to find humor and odd little things. And he thinks like, how is it that we're all subjected to the exact same thing? And some people are affected so differently than others. And you know, that's, I think comes down to mental resiliency and past life experiences and where your mind's at and what you can picture and that support group of what you think you have around, whether real or imagined. Um, but he had that famous quote, the one thing you can't take from me is the way that I choose to respond to what you do to me. The last of life's great freedoms is one's ability to choose their own attitude in any given circumstance. And being able to choose that attitude and knowing that that's a choice, right? If I'm happy, that's a choice. If I'm mad, that's a choice. Like you can do something to me that could make me mad, but you, that's me choosing to be mad. Understanding you, you have that level of control, I think is incredibly powerful in being able to kind of deal with whether it's anxiety or depression or PTSD or whatever it might be. I think that's a, a very powerful part of it. Having that group, that support network, I think is uh, like what you're talking about there, Dean, is incredibly powerful. And he had one story of a, um, of a man who came in and uh, his wife had passed away and he just didn't see any reason for living any longer and all the hardships that he was enduring. And he says, well, what if your wife had lived, right? And you'd been the one who died in this situation. She'd be enduring all of these hardships, wouldn't she? It's like, well, yeah. He says, well, then you've kind of saved her from all of that, didn't you? And now you're carrying that. And, uh, he talks about finding meaning in suffering and there, there is a level of meaning be, by living for others or find, finding that meaning either in suffering and in joy and in, in whatever it might be. And so I've, I've been playing with that concept a little bit in the back of my head and I mean, since we're talking openly here, I figured I'd just throw it out to see kind of what, what your thoughts from your life experiences were. If, if that's a, uh. He's looking at me. Like, <laughs> don't say certain things, Dean. Keep, keep, <laughs> keep some of the things in the book and keep them closed and put under like, yeah, under the little chat. Well, didn't you guys have a chat on the way in about what was not allowed to be said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's his nervous laugh because he thinks now I'm going to tell you, but we've had that chat. So I respect. Well, we have quite. We have. Well, I mean, Brit the British soldiers are, are an in interesting group. Mm. So there are certain things that are, sets us apart, mm -hmm. I would say from other armies. Sure. So. It's our sense of humor. Yeah. Um, it, the battlefield is a horrible place and the, the, the British soldier will make a joke about it. Mm. But to anybody outside of that circle, they'll think, really? Mm -hmm. But for them to operate and keep moving, they have to do something. They have to. If they were to sit there and compute, like, what have I just seen? What, what's just happened? Mm -hmm. Then we start to slow down. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, <laughs> quick joke, right? Let's get on. And, and, and so, but we take that with us forever, that mm -hmm. mentality, laugh, joke. And it's like, oh, do you see what he, he couple's mess like last night? <laughs> right. Do you see Dean was wearing a dress? Oh, he does that every weekend, you know, as a joke. <laughs> but, in the real world, it was like, why do you wear a dress every weekend? It's mm. like, oh, no, no, no. It's just, it, it was theme night. At the, but why do you revert to a dress all the time? Right. Oh, yeah. Why do, you know, do yeah, you know what I mean? Why do you wear a dress? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't aware of this. <laughs> now that we're all inclusive and. Well, somebody left it. Yeah. When they stayed, <laughs> when they stayed one night. Um, so, yeah, that, yeah, that become a bit of a. Becomes a bit uh, of a joke. Yeah. 
But then you just sort of, you carry that on because everybody's laughing about it. Sure. And so it becomes the comedy moment all the time. Yeah. And it's you're like, talking about something in a way that's a little bit healthier than yeah, yeah. either not talking about it or getting down on it. Well, well, we keep revert, well, I keep reverting back to the time in the army, but when my, not my darkest moment, but there were some times where I'd stay in my room and drink because you don't talk about it to anybody. Mm. Because in it, in the old days in the British army, it was you work hard, you play hard. Mm. We go to war, we come home, we see our families, we go to drink. You go down to the NAFI, you go to the UMS, and then you go downtown. Mm. And you just keep, keep repeating this cycle over and over and over and over again. So then if you have got an issue, you're not down the corporate mess, you're at your own home. And mm. You've got a bar downstairs in your cellar or you're in your room in the block and you're drinking with yourself and you're having your moments to yourself and you're thinking if I go out there and start talking to somebody about this, they've got, they might have their own problem or they're going to laugh at me. Mm. It's like I've got men under me that I need to be in command of. Mm -hmm. Can't go and talk to any of them. But if I go talk to the above me, are they going to think I'm weak? Right. So I can't talk to them. So what do I do? I just sit there, get drunk, wake up next morning. Mm. Keep it in. But the the stories that we could tell about our adventures, um, some of them have to be kept under the and in the box because Jason will never allow me to come back to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I would never be able to climb again. Yeah. He would never talk to me again. <laughs> um, but Jace, feel free to share you any know, of mine. Trav, um, my... My granddad mm. on my mom's side was in the Royal Canadian, Air, Royal Canadian Air Force in World War II and he was a crew chief or flight engineer on a Lancaster bomber and uh, he got wounded, took some flak or shrapnel. And, but I remember my mother telling me that Christmases were horrible that she grew up in and mm. there was three sisters and two brothers and the brothers were younger and one wasn't born at the time. And my mom had nothing good to say about her, her life growing up and her um, family, mm. right? It wasn't until I started struggling with my mental health, coming out maybe Afghanistan, um, Iraq, uh, fire service, mm. that I started to analyze the support network that my granddad had, and he didn't have any. Mm. He didn't have it at that time. Um, there was the Sergeant's Mess and the Legion Midros. And that right. was it. Right. So like Dina was saying at that time, he just self-medicated. Mm. He went to the Zarn's mess and got himself drunk, went to the Legion, came home. And now his wife, his three adult daughters or teenage daughters are waiting for him. And he smashed the Christmas tree up. Yeah. Right. So now I'm sitting there analyzing my own journey where I've been and, and um, my uh, my uncle Bruce just passed away a couple of years ago, but he was the last living um, uh, son. And because my mom passed away, everybody. Right. And I said to him, and I said, Uncle Bruce, he doesn't remember any of these stories because he was very young. Mm. So by the time everybody moved out, it was just him and his dad and he had a fishing buddy. Mm -hmm. Doesn't remember any of the anger, the drinking. But I said, Uncle Bruce, you know, there was nothing in place for your dad. There was nothing in place. He, all he had was avoidance and drinking. And he went through this on his own and obviously the family brunt. So I said, you know, I'm not trying to justify what happened, but I'm just saying, I just want everyone in the family to appreciate and understand that he was struggling. There was no support network for him. And like Dean said, like in 2000, like we joined 99 and I left 2009, a little bit longer. Mm. There wasn't any support network. I had a Padre, cause I didn't go with my unit when I deployed to Afghanistan, completely mm. different unit. Came back, so I'm not even with the guys that I served with. And this was 2007. The Padre of my unit debriefed me. I went home for three months on leave. And that was it. That was it. Yeah. Right. And like I said, I, I told you, like I was in a firefight. Taliban sniper missed my head six inches before I came home, mm -hmm. or 24 hours to go on the tour. Yeah. Smelt the cord. I go by, and I'm like, whoa, that's close, right? <laughs> so you literally off that, back to Tewksbury, check in with mother, and on a flight back to Canada. Mm. And that was normalized, right? Left our devices. And that was 2007. 
right? It's not that long ago. Not that long ago. And even like in the fire service, like I don't think mental health was recognized about 2015. Really supportive by mm. WCB getting involved, you know, so it's all relatively newer for us. It's, it's still new. Yeah. Um, I, I remember I had six sessions with the CPN, so I'll be open. What's the CPN? It was like a counseling. Okay. So I'd gone home. I was married at the time, uh, to Guernsey. So flight from Germany back to UK, back to, to Guernsey. Um, and it was two weeks leave. I didn't go back. Mm. I, Tina, the wife was watching a program on the telly and I had a little bit to drink. And then next minute, something had happened on the telly. Mm. I'm under the table. And she's like, what are you doing? I was like, sorry, what? I just, I had a moment. Mm. So I said, I, I, I can't go back. I, I can't talk to anybody. And I was like, so she rang the OC and she rang the battalion and said like, you know, my husband's struggling, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they were like, right, look, get him back, you know, um, and we'll get him some help. And she says, look, it's private in Guernsey. She's got health package. So I goes to this doctor, um, start chatting to him. And he says, can I be honest with you? I said, yeah, please do. Mm. He says, I, I can't, I don't know what you're going on about. Mm. He said, I, 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 I'm not, this is not my field. I don't know how I help you. You know, maybe you get some counseling or, or something, or I give you some pills and mm. I'm very much no pills for me. Thank you. Mm. So then I get sent back to battalion, get picked up at the airport, get back. Um, and Tina said, like, I'll send him back as long as he's going to get help. Yeah, yeah, we're going to help him. We're going to help him. Gets back. Six weeks later, Tina's on the phone to me. I'm drunk in my room. She's like, are you getting help? I was like, yeah, 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 it's all right. It's all right. I got this. She said, you're not, are you? I said, no, no, it's all right. I got this. But I wasn't. So then eventually I got told I had... Um, not an interview. I had a meeting at this place with a, like, not a shrink. It wasn't a shrink. It was just a counselor. Sure. So, so I was like, okay, cool. Where is it? Three buildings down from my bunkhouse. Mm. On our camp mm. was the CPN office. I could have walked down there if somebody told me it was there and I book, booked him myself. Wow. Three doors, three buildings down. Then when I get in and I start talking to this chap, he's ex RAF nurse or something. Mm. So he's like, you know, so, you know, how, what do you want to talk about? So nothing really. I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't really sure. want to talk to you. Sort of. Right. If I'm honest. So he says, well, I'll just tell you a bit about my background. And then you just start, oh, he's ex RAF. Oh, I got these forces. So I can feel a little bit comfortable. Started talking. But honestly, back then, after the fourth session with him, I'm sat there listening to his problems about his wife leaving him uh -huh. and his daughter going out in the local town and the boys meeting her a lot of the times. And I'm like, I I've got to get out. Mm. This isn't helping me whatsoever. So right. he said, so he says, Corporal Nugent, he says, do you think these sessions have been? I said, yeah, thank you. Brilliant. I'm good. <laughs> and I just walked out the door. Yeah. They still, and then with, with Chris, our friend, so since 2014, Chris has had five attempts on his life. And I've been to the hospital where the NHS has signed up to the Armed Forces Covenant and everything else. I said, like, he's a veteran. He needs help. Yeah, just get him to sit over there. And one of his triggers is a baby cry, a baby's crying mm. because of a situation he had. So we're in this hospital. This baby's crying. He has now got his hand and he's digging his nails into his face. He's trying to peel his face off and I'm sat there watching this and I'm like damn let's get him outside some fresh air get him outside he's crying now he's feet he can't do this and I'm thinking so I goes in I said have you not got a room or somewhere where I can sit him down away from everybody else so that I can just he can be in his own environment and I can just calm him down she's like oh I'll, I'll, I'll go and look so she's go look and then they get this room we sit in there comes down until I'm like, when, when we're going to get this guy seen to, you know, we, we don't have, it's not about being priority or anything. There isn't, there isn't a book. 
this is how we solve this problem or this is how we deal with. Right. We're all making, we're, it sounds horrible. We're all making it up as we go along to a point. We're following certain, oh, so the old book from 1950 said we do this, 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 that. Right. That don't work. DSM-3 said this, but DSM-4 contradicts. Now DSM-5 puts it in the cluster group or wh whatever it might be. So what works for me is if I'm out in the Hulu or in the wilds and going for what? Travis, come for a walk with me. Mm. Let's chat. How's everything going on? Well, Dean, do you know what? I don't, mate. Tell me. We'll keep walking until you're finished. You know how few people actually have that in their life? Or have somebody that they can do that with but, in their but life. That's that's that that's that thing, and this is where Chris had that with me, and I have that with Chris, and I have that with Jason. Mm. That Jason needs to go for a walk. Well, Jason, can we not do anything today? Mm. But he knows you need that moment. Do you want to talk about it? Mm. Yeah, I do or I don't. Mm. And that and that, and that's that thing of that again belonging, even if it's one person that that you've feel like belonging to, he's got my back I know that mm -hmm. if it's I'm back in the UK and it's crap mm. I could, I'll ring him up and I could ring him up at silly o'clock mm -hmm. I know I'm going to get an airfall for ringing him up at silly o'clock straight away <laughs> but he'll listen to me yeah and and that's the one thing I learned when I was helping Chris I couldn't help him the way he wanted me to help him mm. I couldn't wave a wand and all of it go away. I needed him to do some things as well. Yes. Yes. And, and, and that was it. We'll always be brothers and I'll help you and I've got your back, but I need you to do some things as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what I've learned. It's that we, we all, we all want help and support, but we need to do something to get to them points as well. I agree. Even if it's small things. Yeah. Diet. Yeah. Exercise, sleep. Don't watch the news. Hydration. Don't watch the news. Get off your device. Get off social media. Whatever, just small things. And maybe it's not, maybe you're stuck on that and that's where you have to be. Okay. Maybe it's 10 minutes. Yeah. Maybe it's 15 minutes and just how do you build that plug away step by step? Yeah. It's interesting you say that, Trav. Um, I can't take credit to it, but there's big four that I, I advocate for and it was a... American veteran that was on maybe, um, YouTube or something. And he's a fitness fanatic. Mm. And he said like in ourselves and, and, and our peers, uh, there's four things that we can monitor. Um, we need purpose, mm. healthy lifestyle. So diet, exercise, substance control, and sleep. And those are the big four that I monitor myself, others. So pur purpose, healthy, healthy lifestyle. lifestyle. Substance control. Substance control. And sleep. Okay. So sleep, and if any one of those goes, then the rest crumble. Mm. So those are the four things that I, I recommend. I, I, we look for, so we're not mental health professionals. So we, no. if one of those are out, it's not our job to, um, to fix that. But that's where we have to be referred or refer our friends to, hey, something's out. Maybe, you know, we're there to listen, but basically those four are kind of like the pillars of, um, how I move forward. Um, and I think it's really important, like, like Dean says, to be there for each other, but it's really important to be a witness to the chaos and not add to the chaos that that individual is going to. That's really critical. Right. So like the, the fellow there who's adding to the chaos that you're speaking with. Yeah. And that's really important. And that has a lot to do like, um, I can relate, um, uh, there's one time in Afghanistan, that's not the time to inject that in, right? It's got nothing to do with you at this nothing moment. Nothing to do with the time. And yeah. that actually, that can also go to like, you're talking about Tiff and, um, Tiff's a great, great lady, lover. Um, uh, but, but when women, <laughs> not women, but I've learned the hard way, like you're on when your, own when on your partner one, comes to you with a problem, yes. they're not looking for solutions. Yes. Unless they ask, yes, they're venting, yeah, right. And I and I had to learn that with um, uh, my ex Laura. Mm -hmm. She had some problem, family problems, and it would be a broken record over and over. Right. Yeah. And then I'm saying I don't want to hear anymore, yeah. right? But what they're doing, or what I've learned, is they're venting, and that's not just partners; that's just friends, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're venting, 
and they're not asking for a solution. Right. Unless they say, what do you think? That's your time yes. to inject, right? That's a very difficult life skill that most people that I seem to encounter have a very limited grasp on. Most people will listen long enough to get their idea that they want to say what they want to say next. That reminds you of the time when, here's when, and they don't truly just listen to what somebody else is saying. Obviously in a podcast scenario like this, we got, we have to have a little bit more thinking what's where we go on, make sure we come back full circle. We got the pen and paper out here to make sure that we're, um, we have some uh, continuity as it goes through, but in regular everyday interactions with your friends, just sitting down and listening and being happy for your friend in a, uh, in a meaningful way, I'd say those number of people in your life, you could count them on a hand, on, on one hand that are, that are able to do that for you. That's been my experience. I concur with that one. Not many people do just sit and listen. Mm -hmm. They want that to put their input right. or what they believe is right, or this is how you should do it. Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, what yeah. do you know? That's really good, Dean. That's like the time I went and, yeah. okay. I was just talking about something I was really happy and proud about, right? Maybe I can have that moment. We give it a little bit of time and then we can talk about your moment, right? Yeah. You know, bringing up a, a mutual friend for, um, for us is my friend, Richie, and you've met Richie a long time yeah. ago. Little Richie. And that's one thing I, yeah, little Richie. <laughs> you know, he's a great, great little dude. Uh, X JTF too. No, no. He went on selection. Okay. I thought he did. Uh, no, he went on selection, but okay. it wasn't for him. Right. Um, okay. Or a seesaw. But you know, he went to Afghanistan, but he became, uh, he wanted to go star tech mm. and I met him on that ski traverse and we're sitting there talking about, um, he wanted to go, be, go on star tech selection, but mm. the recruiting, they was telling me he had to transfer to become a medic and go to Petawawa and he was about to get, become a new, um, uh, husband, mm -hmm. his wife was from Whistler and I'm listening to the story. I'm like, dude. Do not go to Petawawa. <laughs> Do not. They're, they're lying to you. They're trying to get, you're going to be a medic in Petawawa yeah. and not, there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. But you live in Whistler and you're going to move to Petawawa. Right, right, right. And I focused him and he, um, uh, he became a firefighter, did all his training, mm -hmm. firefighter in Whistler, dream job. Mm -hmm. Two kids, awesome wife. But my point about Richie is that I don't have a bigger support that celebrates my wins like Richie. Right. In the guiding. Because yeah. his passion is the mountains, but he's got to be a career, like after his family and kids. And sure. he's getting more and more out now as the kids get older, but Richie, I just, he celebrates every exam I passed and like, it's like he, he's passed too. That's awesome. You know, and I get the support too. And you hold those people but, close. Yeah. But just, I, I don't, this guy just celebrates to the next level. It's crazy how. That's awesome. How in depth it, it is for him. Right. So, little community. Richie, hey? legend, little, little Richie. Little Richie. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in those big four that you put there, I would say finding proper sleep is going to be, uh, an easier one for people to accomplish. Yeah. So right. there's the Zoppoclone, diamond hydrogen, loads whatever, of stuff, yeah. whatever, but, uh, melatonin, but, yeah. but there's, there's something that's achievable and, um, measurable, right? Yeah. Uh, and. What was the substance? Substance uh, control. Substance control. Okay. I get it. Yeah. Maybe if you like to have a couple drinks, maybe just like cut them out for a bit. Social media. Social media, right? It's lots, lots fall into that bracket, right? But there's something that's measurable. Measurable. Right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, what was the other one? Not um, purpose. We'll healthy it. lifestyle. Healthy lifestyle. So exercising, uh, eating Diet. properly, um, again, measurable. I think the tough one in all of those for people would be come back and we're going to come full circle here yeah. is purpose, purpose. right? And what do you find meaningful for yourself? Cause what I find meaningful might not be the same as what somebody else finds meaningful. What I, my aspirations in life, I want to have a strong family. I want my kids to do well and my wife to do well. And it's, I tell them all the time, you can throw a match in the house and burn everything to the ground. We can rebuild that. Right. But having that family network needs to be intact. That's built through trust and it's built through, um, consistently striving to do mm -hmm. better. Uh, that's a huge level of purpose for myself. Some people say, well, I don't have the family, right? Or maybe your purpose is in the mountains. Well, you know, I'm not really, I'm not a mountain person. Maybe it's in running. Ah, oh, my knees are terrible, right? 
uh, finding that level of purpose is I think probably the one piece of that, that, uh, four piece puzzle that might be the sticking block for people that are in an area where they just can't see past the horizon. They can't see that next hurdle and they think, oh, I've got no purpose. I don't have all of these things. Well, Jordan Peterson mentioned in one of his podcasts about when he's advising some of these clients that have shut down or they're not working or they're at home or whatever, he's like, find a job, mm -hmm. right? So that purpose could be simply as finding a job, Yeah. right? Um, I know when I first came back from the UK, I took six months off to do all my fire courses. I had mm. a savings and I could do it. But at six months, my dad said to me, he's like, you need a job. Mm. I'm like, I need a job. <laughs> and um, I, cause it took another six months to get hired. And I had lined up to be an interview for a ski patrol on one of the, one of the hills here. Mm. Uh, come in in the summer and it didn't, it ended up not working out. I remember this. Yeah. And I applied to be, um, OFA three first data tenant at Burnaby city, mm. came for the interview and I said, um, came very apparent in the interview. I wasn't there for a first data attendant. <laughs> I'm like, what's this interview for? They go labor on the blacktop crew. Mm. And I'm like, what do you pay an hour? And this is like 2009. They're like 2650 or $28. Sure. sure. I'm like, I'm in. Yep. <laughs> and, and it actually helped me. Um, cause one of the interview questions I had with, um, the Vancouver fire service was how are you going to handle the sonority? You're a platoon sergeant in the British army and all this other stuff. And, mm. and I said, well, if you look there, I says, I've been working on, uh, Burnaby city labor on the blacktop roads crew. Mm -hmm. And when they said, kid, get in the back of the dump truck, shovel out the rest of the, uh, blacktop. Um, I did that. Mm -hmm. So I have no problem. You want me to look after seven other firefighters in the hall? Yeah. As a probationer, I got it. Clean toilets, anything else, mm -hmm. right? So it definitely set me up for success um, within the Vancouver Fire. Yeah. Was finding that humbling job um, and being the bottom guy. Yeah. And you know, so that's purpose. Put, putting the ego aside. You ego, can put yeah. that ego aside. Well, it doesn't pay enough. I don't want it. Well... We've been chatting for uh, almost two, two hours, hours now. <laughs> two hours. Holy yeah. crow. Drav's going to have to do some editing here. <laughs> <laughs> Big style. Yeah. Part one, part two. Is there anything we should touch on before we wrap up? Well, I'm looking forward to whatever meal Tiff's knocking up, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's I, I'm actually like, breaking yeah. bread with our friends is very important, right? Mm -hmm. The connection. But um, yeah, I think Dean is... Heading home on Saturday, mm -hmm. maybe yeah, back Saturday. in August. We'll see. I've got a Coldplay concert first, not plugging yeah. Coldplay, um, <laughs> but uh, Coldplay. And then I need to check the dates and I want to come back out. Well, we'll listen to the uh, uh, response we get from the listeners and uh, maybe when you come on back, if, uh, yeah. if everyone had a fun time, we can uh, pick up where we left off and catch up on the new adventures that we've oh, had between now and then. Loads. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.